our next presentation is going to start now. It's going to be Daniel uh, Popescu with Make Alerts Great Again. Hello, hello. <clears throat> hello, everyone. So this talk is called Make Alerts Great Again, because that's what we did at Yelp. Yeah. So for those of you that don't know who I am, which is probably most of you, my name is Daniel Popescu. I'm a security engineer at Yelp. I've been there for a little over a year. Prior to that, I was at Microsoft uh, for a number of years. So fun fact about me, I've been attending security conferences for the last 12 years, but this is my first time speaking at one. So thank you, B-Sides. Thank you, B-Sides and Yelp, for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. So if you don't know who Yelp is, which I hope is none of you, Yelp is a company that connects people with great local businesses. And as of a few months ago, uh, here's some statistics about Yelp. So TLDR on this slide is that we have 100 million monthly active mobile users, and we have more than 100 million reviews in our system. So to power a web application uh, of this scale like Yelp, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. So Yelp has thousands of employees, thousands of servers, hundreds of microservices that are deployed on all of those servers. And believe it or not, all of these things behind the scenes generate a ton of logs. So the servers all have endpoint monitoring software on them. The laptops all have endpoint monitoring software on them. Uh, the laptops have antivirus as well. Those are all creating logs. Logs are being produced everywhere. All these microservices are creating logs. Logs, 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 tons of logs. So as a security team, what do you do with all those logs? You build a security pipeline that looks something like this. This probably looks familiar to all of you guys. We have logs from some of the sources I spoke about before and tons of other sources that I didn't mention and tons more that are not on this slide. Uh, we collect those logs from the various sources. We run them through our streaming pipeline. We index them into our data stores. Uh, for us, the two main data stores that we use are Splunk and Elasticsearch. And once we have that data in an indexable format, uh, we're able to visualize and alert uh, on that data. For Splunk, we use whatever built-in uh, alerting mechanism that Splunk has. And for Elasticsearch, we built a framework called ElastAlert, uh, which we've open sourced and we use for visualizing and alerting uh, our data that's in Elasticsearch. So, but there's a ton of data, and, and there's a ton of alerts too. And so, it's easy to fall into some of these common pitfalls of alerting, and uh, we're no different at Yelp. We fell into some of these problems as well. So some of these problems are lack of visibility into alerts. So how many alerts do we have? How, many, how, how often are they firing? Which ones don't ever fire? Uh, some of the alerts were not actionable. A lot of the alerts were going over email, and you know, when, when you send alerts over email, a lot of times they're going to get ignored and you're, you're not going to have any ownership assigned with that. Nothing's going to get done as a result. So there's no standardization a lot of the times. Some people think things are, certain things are really important. Other things, people think things are not very important. Some people think email is fine. Some people want a page for everything that happens. So there's no standards and that's a problem. Um, functional correctness, this is a big problem. So how many of you have tested all of your alerts and you know that they all work? Yeah, that's what I thought. So that's a problem. And false positives are obviously a problem. So I'm happy to work at Yelp, where our alerts are not necessarily rainbows and unicorns. Uh, probably nobody's are. But uh, we have a pretty good system that works for us. Uh, and I'm going to share some of those details with you. So for us, we have historical metrics on all of our alerts. We know how many alerts that we have. We keep our alerts actionable by assigning ownership to all of those alerts. And we have clear incident response steps for all of the alerts that we have defined. And we're pretty sure that all of our alerts are functionally correct. So let me walk you through some of the problems and I'll walk you through some of the solutions that we came to get to the almost rainbows and unicorns land. So the first problem is lack of visibility. So for us, we have alerts that are defined across multiple different systems. Most of them are defined in Splunk 
and in, uh, in Elastalert, which is on top of Elasticsearch. So the problem there is that there's no comprehensive dashboard that shows us how many alerts do we have, which ones are firing all the time, uh, which ones send email versus which ones create Jira tickets versus which ones page. Uh, in the past, you know, when, when we wanted to get the answers to those things, we'd have to do a whole bunch of manual steps and you know, produce a spreadsheet that would then be out of date a few weeks later. So uh, yeah, so the solution that we came up for that is that we created a service called the Alert Reporter. So what this, this service does, it's a standalone Python service and it produces a report weekly in uh, a spreadsheet form. And it basically aggregates, it, it collect, it asks Splunk, it asks Elastalert, it asks the XYZ alerting frameworks that we have. Give me all the details from the last week about the alerts that have fired. And it produces a report that allows us to have gain valuable insights into which alerts are possibly too noisy, how many alerts do we have. I know that we have 173 alerts somehow. That's pretty awesome. Um, and it lets us kind of, you know, take a take a higher take a step back and take a 10,000 foot view at our alerts and see which ones are maybe firing too often, which ones have too many false positives, and you know we can focus our attention on which ones are important to us. So that visibility is super important. And if you don't know how many alerts you have defined, you guys should do something like this. So the next, yeah, so uh, here's an example of what that report looks like. So, Actionability. So this is this is the biggest problem that we had that uh, that we solved. So, uh, first of all, if you have alerts that are being sent over email, they're just not going to be actionable. You can't expect people to be monitoring their inbox all the time for uh, for critical alerts that are going to email. What happens is you send these alerts to people's inboxes. People see a, f a couple of them, and then they're going to create filters, and they're never going to see them again. So you know that that happens. And there's no ownership with emails. So ticketing systems are better, but uh, so you can at least assign an owner to a ticket, and that's kind of cool. But there's still no enforcement that anything's going to get done with that ticket. It could just get you know, lost on some Jira queue. And who knows if the person who that ticket is assigned to is actually going to do anything. You know, People have to go, the security team has to go and look at the queue and follow up with people. And we don't want to do that. So talking about email, so here's an example of an, or back in the day when we used to do alerts over email. So here's a set of alerts that fire when people are making changes to our AWS infrastructure without following proper change control procedures. So as you can see, we have about 15 emails or so, and all of those emails are coming from our alerting framework. And in only one of the cases do we have a real human actually responding to the alert. So that's interesting. What about all those other cases? So let, let's look at some of these emails. Here's the email from the human, Giannis. Giannis says, hey, this was me creating the RDS instances for some help desk ticket. And if we look at the email that he responded to, here's an event that's in there. And we see, yeah, there's the event. There's Giannis creating a role called RDS monitoring role. That seems to corroborate his story. Now let's look at some of the other events and some of those other emails that nobody replied to. So here's an example where a user named Matt is adding the user Jay Sendor to the admins group. So when somebody adds somebody to the admins group, I want to know about it. And in this case, nobody acknowledged it. So was this something, oh, is this something normal? Is this some malicious insider? Is this some malware? I don't know because nobody acknowledged it. And I probably wouldn't have scoured my emails looking for these events if uh, I wasn't giving this presentation. So you know, these things get lost in email. So here's another example. Here, the user Martin has somehow removed himself from the user's group require 2FA, require, require MFA. So MFA stands for multi-factor authentication, obviously. This is obviously a problem if someone can remove themselves from the group that mandates 2FA. So if somebody does this, I want to see the help desk ticket or some kind of ticket, some kind of background context on why they did this. And I don't want it to go, you know, unacknowledged. Here's another, yeah, here's another case, or here's another event from one of those other emails. So here, the user L. Matthew has 
changed a network security group in Amazon, in AWS, and it looks like he's allowed basically any machine in the whole world to connect to any port on any EC2 instance that's associated with the security group. That looks like it's either something malicious or possibly a mistake, um, but I don't know if L. Matthew was ever uh, you know, notified that he made this change, or I don't know if he even made the change, maybe it was some malware. I don't know, I really wanna to talk to L. Matthew about this and why he did that. So, uh, so yeah, so that's email, let's not do that. So here's an example of some JIRA tickets. So JIRA tickets are better, um, and if you're like me and you're really good with your ticket hygiene, uh, you, follow, you, you monitor the queue and when something comes in, it gets assigned, to you, a, a ticket comes in and you basically acknowledge it and you close the ticket. But not everyone else is as good with their ticket hygiene as I am. So here's a case of Giannis on my team. And this is an alert that fires when somebody logs into a production machine that they haven't logged into in a long time. This is meant to detect malware attacks and stuff like that. So uh, in this case, the ticket was created. Giannis doesn't acknowledge. So I, I monitor the queue and I find that this ticket is outstanding. And I ping Giannis in Jira. I say, hey Giannis, can you acknowledge this ticket? Another day goes by, no acknowledgement. I say, hey, Giannis, ping, are you there? No acknowledgement. Then I say, another day goes by, and I say, hey, Giannis, uh, can you acknowledge this ticket? I'm gonna CC your manager. And that ends up being kind of effective, but I don't really wanna do that. Like, I I've got better things to do than sit there monitoring the queue and pinging people in Jira. So what do we do to solve some of these problems? Yeah, so. Here's the solution for fixing the non-actionability. So first of all, just don't use emails for alerts. Just, just forget about it. You, I guess you can still send them and send them to some alias for like, you know, if you're bored one day and you want to historically go and look at what alerts have fired, but don't expect any action to happen as a result of the, of the emails that have been sent. So for Jira, so Jira has a pretty cool feature called Service Desk. So we've enabled the service desk feature on our uh, security alerts queue, or our alert security alerts project. And what that enables us to do is set up SLAs and queues. So we can define that P0 tickets, priority zero tickets, need to be turned around or acknowledged within one hour. We can, say, we can set different SLAs for different uh, priorities. And it's open-ended, you can, make these, you can make basically assign a prior, uh, an SLA with any arbitrary JQL, Jira query, language query. Um, so the Jira queues are actually really cool too. So uh, you don't get this by default in Jira, but if you have a service desk project, you can set, create these different queues so that you can see at a, at a quick glance what's the distribution of the active tickets um, in your security alerts project. So uh, I mentioned SLAs. So if you see up there, there's some examples of what, what the SLAs give you. So You'd be surprised at how effective it is when there's a little colored icon and a, and a timer that ticks down. It's actually really effective to get people to like want to take action and resolve that ticket before it turns yellow or red or, or negative. It's super effective. Psychology is awesome. So, but that's not the full answer. So, because again, people might not be looking at those tickets and then I have to get involved and, and refresh the Jira queue all the time and I don't want to do that. So, we built a service called the Actionable Alerting Service. Now, the Actionable Alerting Service basically enforces action on tickets and it does this by doing two things. It finds tickets that are unassigned and it attempts to find an assignee for that ticket and it does that using a variety of heuristics that I'll talk about in just a second. And when it finds tickets that are assigned to people but past due, or past the SLA has been breached, it knows how to escalate those tickets in various different ways. Um, and the way that it does this, it's a, it's a stateless service, it doesn't have a data store or anything like that. It just looks, it inspects the ticket metadata and we give the actionable alerting service just enough information in the JIRA ticket so that it can carry out its duties. So, one of the ways that the actionable alerting service assigns ownership to a ticket is we have something that's called self-service alerts. So the whole purpose of self-service alerts is to get the security team out of being the critical path for getting acknowledgement on tickets. So for a self-service alert, 
when someone does a common administrative task like adding someone to the admins group or make some kind of infrastructure change to, to AWS like opening firewall ports or whatever in network security groups. Uh, yeah. Um, so the, the tickets get automatically assigned to those people so that we don't have to go and track them down. And this is, this is meant to do a couple things. It's, a, it's meant to find sketchy uh, internal actors doing weird things. It's meant to find mistakes, like someone accidentally opening all the ports to all the, all the firewalls to all, all of the world to a certain EC2 instance. And it's meant to find potentially any like sketchy malware attacks that might be happening where someone's laptop is infected and it's doing things on that person's behalf. So in that case, uh, the ticket would get assigned to the person and they would say, hey, I didn't, I didn't do this, I didn't create this new user. And then we would, you know, we would, then at that point the security team would get involved and we would begin our incident response. Yeah, uh, so, so it's kind of on the honor system. So on the internal bad actor uh, scenario, you might think, well, hey, like, you know, if I'm an internal bad actor, I'm just gonna acknowledge that ticket. Well, we have as part of our on-point pr process that we go back and audit all of those acknowledgements, uh, you know, retroactively, and we make sure that there's no funny business. So here's an example of a self-service alert. We have a JIRA ticket, and in the JIRA ticket, there's a little piece of metadata that says where to extract the actor name from that event. And as you can see here from the event, this was a duo integration change. So uh, in this case, you can see duo data dot username is Alec T. The actionable alerting service goes and looks up Alec T in Active Directory, assigns the ticket to him, and gives him a little ping in JIRA. So sometimes the user, the actor, is not actually a, a real human. Sometimes there are service accounts that make these changes, and this is common when, uh, when the Corp Eng team has some shared scripts that or, or web applications that make certain changes for them. So when that happens, it's hard to find an owner. So you, you can't just assign a ticket to the service account. So the actionable alerting service in that case will look up the user, it will determine that it's not a real user and it's a service account, and it knows how to track down the owning team that owns that service account. And it will go and ping them in JIRA, or sorry, it'll ping them in JIRA, and IRC and or Slack or whatever chat mechanism that they have and say, hey, group that owns this service account, uh, one of you guys need to please acknowledge this because this thing happened. So that, that's self-service alerts and that's one way that the actionable alerting service assigns ownership. Another way that we can assign ownership is by uh, referencing a pager duty schedule name in the ticket. And so this is super effective to get, you know, get the person who's currently on point Looking at looking at the ticket uh, instead of having it go to email or something like that, or or sit unassigned in the queue. So here's an example of that. The ticket has some metadata in there that says the pager duty schedule name. This is an alert called Google suspicious login. That's something pretty sensitive. We want the current on point person to look at it quickly. So here, uh, the actionable alerting service looks up the malware on point uh, schedule name and pager duty, finds that the current assignee for that schedule is Megan, and it assigns the ticket to her. So if it's not a self-service alert and if we think it's not as important enough to uh, justify getting the current on point assigned to it, then kind of a last ditch effort is to assign the ticket to the owner of the alert. So the owner of the alert is gonna have the most context on what that alert means and how to deal with it and that person can be held responsible for either following up with someone or initiating incident response or acknowledging and closing the ticket. So, now we've figured out how to assign the tickets to people, we have owners, but what happens when those owners are lazy and don't uh, respond to their tickets? So in the past, I had to go and monitor the queue and say, hey, you know, acknowledge this ticket, acknowledge this ticket, I'm gonna CC your manager. So now we have a computer to do all that for us. So it can ping the user in IRC, it can ping the user in JIRA, it can ping the user's manager in JIRA, and you'd be surprised, actually you're probably not surprised at how effective it is when you CC someone's manager in communications, it really, it really gets action to happen. So here's an example of that, here's a JIRA ticket that's past due, and a few days goes by, and it doesn't get acknowledged, so then you can see on the second comment there, the actionable alerting service kicks in and says, hey, uh, uh, Jose, this ticket is past SLA for resolution, please, you know, please take a look at this. And as you can see a few moments later, 
the ticket gets acknowledged. Um, so here's the example similar to when I had to go and bug before and CC people's managers. Here the actionable alerting service notices that a, a ticket is past due. It first tries pinging in JIRA. If that doesn't work, after another configurable amount of time, it goes and escalates by adding the manager, the, the person's manager to the ticket. And as you can see there, it's super effective. So another problem that we had is that there was no standardization with our alerts. So you know how this is. There's no RFC for writing alerts. So one person thinks that everything's really important to, and everything is P0. And another person thinks like, ah, oh, well, you know, this is fine. That can wait till tomorrow. And when there's no, like, when there's no standards, you leave this to people's opinions, and then you have your alerts that are in various different states. And it's really kind of hard to keep track of them, and it's hard when an alert comes in if you should really like believe the priority or not, because at that point it's gonna depend on who the author was. So what did we do that? What did we do to fix that? So we implemented a playbook, a runbook, for writing new alerts. It's a manifesto that, that basically defines what constitutes a priority zero issue, when is it appropriate to page versus email versus JIRA, actually it's, never, it's pretty much never appropriate to email. Um, it talks about what kind of mandatory fields we require to set. At a minimum, you should set the owner on the alert so that the actionable alerting service can do its job. And um, it talks about the various feature sets we have, like when it makes sense to make a, a, t a, an alert self-service versus not self-service and whatnot. It also specifies the, like the, the proper granularity for an alert. So, for example, maybe you shouldn't have a P0 alert that like, hey, a security group changed. You know, maybe it makes more sense to have a, 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 a higher priority alert for when the scope of access has been increased on a security group and maybe when the scope of access has been decreased on a security group, maybe that's less important and that can be, you know, treated as a lower priority uh, thing to follow up on. So finally, finally, it talks about testing and it, ma it basically mandates that any new alert you write needs to be tested. So speaking of testing, <clears throat> we've, we've found in the past that a lot of our alerts were sitting there with bugs, with latent bugs, just such that the alerts didn't actually work. Maybe it was a typo in the, the Splunk query where it was querying the wrong index name. Or maybe there was an assumption about the data. You assume some field was always gonna be present, but in the particular scenario that you're trying to catch, that field is actually not present. So uh, that's a problem. And uh, another problem is that uh, sometimes the data sources have problems. Or something upstream of your alerting framework. So sometimes the data source just drops off the map for some reason, either to a full flat line or like a dramatic drop in volume. Like, you know, when you upgraded the Linux kernel on all your hosts and suddenly after that day, no more logs came in and you didn't find out for like two months until you were investigating something else. That's a huge problem. So what do you do to solve that problem? Well, I kind of touched on, upon this earlier, but for all of the new alerts you write, you need to test them end to end. Don't, you can't call an alert done until you've actually seen it fire for the thing that you're trying to catch. So if you're trying to catch somebody making a reverse shell or doing something sketchy or ex exfilling data, once you deploy that alert, go and exfil that data. Go create a reverse shell and wait five minutes and wait to get that alert. And if you don't get that alert, there's a problem, and you want to find it then instead of realizing six months down the line that the alert doesn't work. Um, definitely create flatline alerts, so make sure you have alerts that, that fire when the data disappears over some amount of some range of time. And not only complete flatlines, but volume drops as well. And also test those flatline alerts. <clears throat> Yeah, so the last thing I'll talk about is false positives. So obviously there's always gonna be false positives. There's, it's really hard to prevent false positives. Um, for example, when your uh, antivirus on the Mac laptop finds a Windows executable, that's probably not that big of a deal. That's a false positive. Um, when you deploy a new production server service and it's listening on some ports that were never listening, that were never being listened on before, um, an alert is probably gonna fire for that and it's not really a big deal and it's a false positive. So, um, how do we rectify these false positives? 
The way we rectify that is through automation. So automate your incident response steps. Make it such that when, it fall, when an alert comes in, you can make the call of whether or not it's a false positive really quickly. And so that you're not spending a whole bunch of time chasing your tail trying to figure out if this is a false alarm or if it's something real. You definitely don't want to spend two days on something that ends up being a false positive. So write the scripts. And if you're writing a script that's going to automate a whole bunch of steps, and you have that for when the alert comes in, consider pushing that upstream into your alerting framework. So why have a human being involved in hitting enter on some script when you can just plug that into your alerting framework itself? So how do we measure success? So this is really hard for me to do because in the past we didn't really have much visibility into what was going on. We just had a bunch of emails that were not being acknowledged and uh, you know, tons of events were kind of piling up all over the place and it was really hard to tell what was going on. So, but today, I, what I can tell you is that our active ticket queue is totally manageable and the SLAs are breached less than 50% of the time, so that's good. Um, we've gotten positive response from the people who are triggering these alerts most of the time, which is our operations team and our corp eng team. And the security team is happy because we're no longer the critical path for getting traction when these alerts happen. So we can work on bigger, better things. So here's the recap of the problems and the solutions. You can look at those on the slides later. And the three things I really want you guys to get out of this talk. One, make your alerts actionable. Two, make sure you have visibility into your alerting metrics. And three, make sure your, tests act, your alerts actually work by testing them. And that's all I have to say. So. I had one more thing to say, I guess. Um, here are some social links, social media stuff for Yelp, and thank you. Thank you, Daniel, on behalf of B-Sides and Link oh. <laughs> Fitbit. Thank you. <laughs>